as you're well aware, today is uh, U.S. Amateur Team East, and how many times have you personally played in it? Uh, more times than I can remember, because I was one of the founding people that, that worked on establishing it decades ago with Ed Edmondson, then the executive director of USCF. I was president, and someone called Dennis Barry, who, of course, was also a past president of New Jersey, and and he later became a past president of the U.S. Chess Federation, too. So, I mean, we, we go back a long way, over 50 years. Yep, definitely uh, quite some time. Um, as I say, if before Sean hops off, he's going to probably grab some lunch soon. Is there anything you want to uh, toss in there, Sean? I'm sorry. Oh, um, I'm sorry you asked me. <laughs> um, if there's anything you had to... I want to ask Leroy before you had a well I I I mean the, the, we definitely have some questions that I'm very interested in the in the answer to um but um yeah the I'd really love to hear more about what it was like in the in the fishy fisher Basky era um but oh, I'm sorry I'm having a technical over here for a second. I'm trying to fix. I'm not seeing. Oh. Well, he figures out his issue. So one thing recently, like the Queen's Gambit, I feel has been a big boon to U.S. chess. Um, a lot of more interest in there. The thing that I could relate to is uh, my dad had said the same about the fishy uh, Fisher era that he also had a big like influx of new players when he went on to become world champion. Have you seen any similar like uh, comparisons in that regard, Leroy? Well, I mean, uh, during the Fisher era, the U.S. Chess Federation's membership uh, increased uh, over a four-year period, including the, the time, you know, while Fisher was trying for the world champion and then became it, uh, by about 500%. <laughs> From about 12,000 members to 60,000 members. That kind of percentage growth, of course, never has occurred since then, okay? I mean, you know, 60,000 members. Uh, so the impact was tremendous in terms of the publicity that we got. Uh, some people estimate it was hundreds of millions of dollars of free publicity for chess, because Fisher was on the cover of Life Magazine, Time Magazine, and everything else. So that was a great time for for us in terms of getting members in and so on, the Fisher boom. Uh, but that I think is fairly well known. There, there are some things that uh, go back in, in terms of Fisher winning the world championship and what we had to go through that isn't that well known. I mean, the United States had to gain control of the World Chess Federation because Bobby Fischer was not eligible under the current rules to even play in a candidates tournament. And the winner of that, of course, would play Spassky because he hadn't played in the US championship in the year he was supposed to have. He didn't play, therefore he wasn't even eligible. We had to change the rules. The Russians would simply have blocked them. So we had to get control. And the big thing was in 1970 in Siegen, West Germany, there were elections for the World Chess Federation, for their so-called Central Committee. Even the name, as you know, is sort of a communist <laughs> name, Central Committee. And uh, they had, had been in iron control of the World Chess Federation from the end of World War II up through 1970. And the question was, how could we win an election against an opponent that had won every other election? Uh, and so it's an interesting story if you want to hear it. It'll take about oh, five minutes. Definitely. Uh, uh, what what I realized was the Russians, for all of the power they had, they had one enormous weakness. Namely, back home, the bosses wanted to control everything. That meant when they went into it, there were 10 seats on the World Chess Federation Central Committee. They had one person for each of the 10 seats, okay? And therefore, the orders were, this is what happens. But what if something went wrong? Who would have the authority to make changes and, and uh, react to it? And in my conclusion in analyzing is 
no one that was there would have the authority and they'd be afraid of being accused of making a mistake. And so what I, what, what, what I planned was simply to ask the World Chess Federation president, his name was Folk Rogard, he was a lawyer, but his law firm, I was told anyway, main client or only client was the Soviet Union. So you understand the influence they had on it. Uh, for one little change, and this is what I told them, I said, can't we change the way we vote so that we don't vote for all 10 positions at the same time but one at a time. So if a good man loses, he can run for another position. That was the only thing I asked. I, I have one, no way of knowing what went on in his mind, but I suspect he thought, what a dumb American. What does it matter if the Russians vote 10 times or one time for 10? The, out, the outcome is the same and the American will be happy, okay? So he said, good idea. And he changed it. Now, for the, the new presidency to replace him, Max Oyo, we and the Russians had already agreed the prior year we would both support him. So there was no election. I mean, there was an election, but you know, he was the only candidate who was unanimous. It was for the first vice presidency. We were supporting someone called Rebel Mendez from Puerto Rico. And the Russians was, I, I can't remember the guy's name, I'm sorry. It was a Czech, okay? Someone from Czechoslovakia. And I told Ed Edmondson, who was our executive director, and he really, deserves the credit for this, for what, what happens next. Because he had contacts, he was supported all the way up to Kissinger in the White House, okay? They wanted Fisher to be able to get a shot at it, for us to get control of FIDE, so that, because it would be a real shot in the head against the Russians who claimed that they were better at chess because the communist system was better than the capitalist system, okay? That's what the Russians claimed. That's why they were better at chess. And so the wonderful thing from the point of view of Nixon and Kissinger is that we beat them at chess. What does that say about the converse? Uh, so uh, I said, if somehow or other you can convince one of the countries that the Russians uh, count on for voting for them to change their vote on just this one position, we'll win everything. How that happened, I don't know. This is where you get into CIA versus KGB and that, and you know, I, I don't know. But the fact is, I was told, watch so-and-so, when he delivers the ballot on that, you sit right in front of the ballot box. That was Edmondson's orders to me. And we ran our thing like a military operation. He was a retired Air Force Colonel. And make sure he doesn't change his hand. However, they got this person to change, and even now I don't want to say who it was. The communists knew there was someone that double crossed them, but they didn't know who. We won by one vote, one country out of 72. We won this, the first vice presidency. I then stood up and said, well, uh, let's have the vote for the second vice presidency, one minute after. Now the Russians had the problem. The guy that had lost the check he was under orders to get on the Central Committee from his own Communist Party back in Czechoslovakia. So he was afraid to remove his name or they'd say, you should have tried. However, the guy, whoever it was that was scheduled for the second vice president kept his, and they had two candidates. What do you think happened? We had one, we crushed them. The next one, they had three candidates, we had one, and it just went on and on we got down to the final three, which were called at large. They would all be done at the same time. And at that point, Edmondson sent me a note saying, stop the election. He didn't tell me why. This wasn't a, uh, a discussion club. You get an orders from whoever's in charge. I stood up immediately and said, I'm very hungry. Uh, can't we stop for lunch? Folk Rogard, who thought, you know, he's not gonna, he's gonna be wiped out. It's gonna be a nine to nothing in the contested must have thought I was crazy. Why was I stopping instead of just cutting their throat once the last time? And he didn't ask for a vote. He says, no, we're stopping for two hours, okay? That was his way out. He was doing what he could for his client, the Russians. When, when this uh, uh, happened then, I got up and Emerson came up to me and said, the Russian delegate wants to talk to me privately. Well, we got a little problem. The problem was he always had a companion, a translator who Edmondson told me was the head of the KGB uh, uh, entity associated with this. And, and he told me, by the way, that this guy was a trained assassin. And so he then said, he said, well, we got a little problem. Uh, I can't talk to him while so-and-so is there next to him. You got to get him away. So well, you know, what am I going to do? And he said, well, we're going to walk down. This is Sigan, the streets 
there's a haberdashery store. We're going to go buy the haberdashery store. And when uh, you, you pass it by, you grab uh, this agent by his arm and say, you're such a good dresser. Give me a little advice. I want to buy a jacket and drag him in. I said, I said, Ed, he's not stupid. He knows that there's something up. He said, of course he does. It doesn't matter if you buy anything. He said, I said, well, what if he hits me? He said, he wouldn't dare. You're president of the U.S. Chess Federation. Be an international incident. It's public. You're perfectly safe. I always wondered how perfectly safe it was. In the military, sometimes it's the, the mission that matters. And if there's a <laughs> casualty, it's part of it. Anyway, I thought that was the bravest thing I ever did while I was USCF president. I grabbed this KGB agent, dragged him in. And I don't even remember now because who cares? <laughs> Whether I even bought a jacket or what we looked at when we got out, Edmondson and the KG and the the Russian diplomat who was the head of all of this was gone. Now, uh, uh, when we came back, Ed said, "We're voting for him." I said, "If we're voting for him, the KGB agent knows you made some kind of a deal." He said, "Of course," and and the the the, the diplomat's going to tell him, "Yes, I begged him to put me on the the Central Committee." They, I had control, and in exchange, I would do him a favor later. But I lied to him, I'll screw him later. To a KGB agent screwing a military guy from the United States, perfectly acceptable. So they all smiled, they thought they had a deal. Edmondson thought he had a deal, and they won one position out of the 10. Now, the question is, who was right? I, 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 I don't know about the following, I just know that years later, two years later, when, when it was setting up, where would we play a match when Fisher was scheduled um, uh, to, to play in, in the final round before the world championship? He, he was uh, scheduled. Uh, he had won uh, the, uh, when there were four candidates, eight candidates, and he went to the four, and this was down to the final two. Uh, and the Russians wanted one of the East European dictatorships, and Bobby Fisher wanted to play in the right wing a military dictatorship. And Edmondson found one of them that was willing. I think it was Argentina now, but I'm not, but any, any event. That was our proposal. We'll play there. Fisher liked to play there. The Russians liked to play in a communist paradise. How was it resolved? I was told this is what happened finally. The Russians wouldn't budge, we wouldn't budge. And eventually it was decided they would do it by a toss of a coin. Now, why would the Russians have agreed? They knew we had a majority control on the Central Committee. So if we didn't, it'd be raw power, we would win. So anyway, supposedly, this is all from Edmondson, who's gone now. I mean, he died tens of years ago. Uh, he and the Russian diplomat went up to his room. And in private, with no one else there, they tossed a coin as to where the match would be held. Guess who won? Me? Edmondson. It's 50-50 when you toss a coin. The Russians can't shoot the diplomat because I'm sure he would have told them, well, we had a 50% chance. It didn't turn out. Otherwise, the damn Americans would have screwed us. They, they control the Central Committee. We still would have been screwed. So Fisher got his right-wing dictatorship where he played. And uh, uh, Edmondson told me when Fisher arrived, he had all of these conditions, you know, got to be X feet away, the lighting, this, that, and everything else down there. And he then asked the military who were listening to him, but what if the Russians object? And the military said, they're communists, screw them. You got everything you want, Bobby. <laughs> and Fisher turned and said, you see, that's why I want it here. They know how to treat them. So that, I think, was the payoff. Edmondson never said that he actually tossed a coin or not. All he said is we won. Sorry, but that's, that's a sort of interesting story. Uh, that yeah, perhaps, perhaps a lot of people haven't heard. I was going to say, it's yeah. definitely, uh, seems like something that you probably did not originally sign up for when becoming president. Like, I don't think you were expecting espionage and... Uh, no, no, I wasn't. I, 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 I wasn't. But uh, let, let me give you the piece of advice Ed Edmondson, who we were close, I was a close friend to him, gave me. That's really the best piece of advice I've ever had in my lifetime. He said, Leroy, when you see the way things actually are done here, what we were involved in, he said, two things will happen. Number one, you'll be smarter for it. And I said, and what's the second thing, Ed? He says, I don't think you'll be happy. <laughs> <laughs> oh.
Unfortunately, it seems it worked out in the end. Fisher went on to become world champion, and as you and, mentioned, that massive growth we had. Yes. It's like, I probably wouldn't be playing chess now if Fisher never happened. Yeah. Well, well, I mean, Fisher was wonderful for us. It also would have been wonderful if he had continued to play after he won the world championship. He didn't play for, what was it, 15 years or so until that uh, follow-up match with Spassky that occurred in uh, the former Yugoslavia. And, and because uh, 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 no American was supposed to be involved financially, Fisher was, was then prosecuted by the government so he could never come back in the U.S. because he participated. But he never played a single serious game after that. And, and that's, I mean, if I compare him to Magnus Carlsen, both were, in my opinion, it's an opinion, of course, the greatest player of their, their era when Fisher won the world championship. He was the greatest. Uh, and Magnus is today the greatest player. But that's where it ends. Because uh, imagine Fisher forfeited in 1975, three years later. There was a huge prize fund. You know, when he won the world championship, the prize fund was $250,000. You know, I think it was five A's to the winner, three A's to the loser. When he forfeited only three years later, the prize fund was $5 million. I don't remember the split, five A's, three A's, 60%, 40%. But, but Edmondson told me what wasn't known was that there was an under the table appearance fee for Fisher of another $5 million. That meant he could have played, lost to Karpov, and walked away with around $7 million. There's a 1972 dollars. It's, what would that be now, guys? Uh, I don't know, 30 million, 40 million today? Uh, more money uh, and, than and, I've and, and we couldn't, by it, we begged him to play, we couldn't get him to play. Now, now, what do you think would happen if someone offered Magnus Carlsen today something where even if he lost his title, doesn't matter who, you're going to get 30 or 35 million Magnus. Do you think someone would have to beg him, please play for $35 million if you lose, more if you win? I think that uh, Magnus's only question would be, when does it start? <laughs> I mean, so th that's an enormous difference be between the two of them. Okay. My, my two cents worth, anyway. And, and there's one other difference between them. Fisher, you know, was offered Again, I was told, I don't know this firsthand, uh, large fees to endorse things like a soda or a car. You ride in the back seat holding a chess set and it doesn't wobble because the ride is so smooth. In each case, he turned it down because he liked a different brand or another car. Well, but I think the real reason was Fisher realized one thing. He never wanted anyone to take advantage of it. That if a company offered him money for, for an endorsement, they would make more money than they were paying him. And he didn't think that was fair. I think that was the basis. I therefore wouldn't call Fisher, what's the phrase, a good businessman. I don't think once again, Magnus would have a tough uh, time drinking a, a bottle of soda for a million bucks today. He'd manage to do it and smile. So I think Magnus is a much more up-to-date modern businessman. Okay, this would, because everyone knows, why do they offer celebrities money? They of course expect that the endorsement is worth more than they're paying you. That's business. Fisher was right on that, yes. Each of these companies expected his endorsement would get them more money than what they were paying him. But that's life. He just didn't like it. Yeah. Say, I think that might be a product of the times, too. I feel chess nowadays, it's definitely a lot more commercialized than back in the day. Fisher, yeah. especially during the Cold Era, as you said, there was a lot of like country versus country as opposed yeah. to individualism. Yeah, that you're certainly correct. You're certainly correct, Don. Yeah, what else what can I do for you? I'm curious what other differences you see, not just between Magnus Carlsen and Fisher, but between the chess world more generally right now compared to in 1972. Well, well I think the huge difference is the internet right. today. We, of course, didn't have an internet. If you wanted to play remotely, you either got on a telephone, there were telephone team matches, or you did it by snail mail. And I played games, it took me six or eight months. I didn't do it very often. Uh, it was too tedious, too slow for me. Now we have the internet, that's changed things and also computerized chess. You can, you can look at a chess opening, what do I do? 
your computer program, if you've got a good one, will tell you and tell you what grandmasters have done because they've got a million games of that that they can draw on. That wasn't, uh, so in that sense, it's different than modernization, but especially the internet has really changed things, which after all, that's the team tournaments going on now. It's over the internet. Yeah, that's right. That's I know it. just personally as a, as a player and just as a, and as a coach now, that uh, when I even just not going back to 1972, but when I was starting to play, there was a reputation just for people in the North Jersey area where I grew up in New York that because we had access to the Manhattan Chess Club or the Marshall Chess Club or these other like, you know, all these big, like not just big, but like weekly, you could play every weekend if you wanted to play a classic chess here, whereas there might be somewhere else in a different part of the country where I'd play somebody at nationals and I might expect them to be underrated. Whereas now, like you were saying with the internet and all these computers, it's just the access to information is just so, yeah. so yeah. different. I imagine that being even bigger in 1972 when maybe a lot of the best chess books might have been written in Russian or, or, yes. or not in English. Or, um, uh, guys, I do have this appointment coming up where I have to take my cat oh, yeah, to yeah. the vet. Important. Yeah, so mm -hmm. it's been good talking to you. Hope, uh, hope I've at least said something interesting. Very interesting. Thank you, Leroy. Okay, yeah. take care. Good luck. Good luck with the event. Okay. <laughs>